question is, yeah. is today going to be more fun or tomorrow? <laughs> tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> this is uh, this is Yeah, right. Yeah. I don't like having to do two hearings in two years. You say you got a lot of what people. Issue is? Uh, <coughs> uh, the postal issue? The postal issue? Oh, no, no. Oh, I, oh. I, I have a new uh, postal oh, oh, yeah. oh, wait, I'm sorry, we confused our robs. So someone in, in my office named Rob who called me. Oh, okay. And, and right, when the phone rang, that's what Okay, then I have no idea. I thought that it was our Rob. Like this, this is Rob. And, uh, then he didn't know what it was. I know about it. Just a nice guy. He wants everybody to be participating. Yeah. 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 What a mess. Yeah, that was really bad. I'm sure he paid her $150,000 because he didn't touch her. Sure, that's why. Check one two, check one two. Check one two three, check one two three. Check one two, one two, one two, one two.
Thanks, Jill.
Good afternoon. The Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce Postal Service in the District of Columbia hearing will now come to order. I apologize for the brief delay. We have a lot going on here today. Uh, members will be coming in and leaving periodically. Unfortunately, we seem to schedule everything at the same time here uh, in light of the work that needs to be done. Following the, uh, I want to welcome my friend and ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz from Utah, and members of the subcommittee hearing, witnesses, and all those in attendance. In light of the recent attacks and violent outbursts against federal workers and facilities, I've called today's hearing to examine federal and postal employee workplace security. The chair, ranking member, and the subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. I'd also like to ask unanimous consent that the testimony of Congressman Benny Thompson, who was our chairman of the Committee on Homeland Security, and that of a DOD employee be submitted for the record. Hearing no objection, objection uh, so ordered. Ladies and gentlemen, in recent weeks we have wit witnessed several brutal attacks and violent outbursts against federal workers and facilities, which is why I have called today's hearing. Tragically, in 2010 alone, a U.S. court security officer in Las Vegas and an IRS manager in Austin, Texas have lost their lives, while several law enforcement personnel, including a deputy U.S. marshal and members of the Pentagon Force Protection Agency, have been injured in the line of duty. Given the rise of anti-government feeling, as notably reported in the Southern Poverty Law Center's 2009 report entitled The Second Wave, I believe that as chairman of the subcommittee I have a duty to examine how well positioned federal agencies and the Postal Service are for similar events. Today's hearing will also allow us to discuss what agencies are doing to provide comprehensive training and guidance to employees on how to respond to such threats and scenarios. It's one thing to hear about agencies wrestling with how to afford purchasing expensive security countermeasures, but it's quite a different matter to listen to federal employees recount the lack of emergency preparedness of a particular office. It may be that as an agency, an emergency plan exists, but if the individual workers aren't familiar with it and are not even practicing any type of evacuation drills, then what type of uh, outcome can we expect if and when disaster strikes? An important item to note here is that the federal and postal employees warrant our respect. For some to look at the violence directed against IRS employees and to try to justify that uh, deliberate intent to murder other human beings is, is simply inexcusable and unacceptable. Uh, our nation's public servants deserve nothing less than our full support and to know that all of us from the President to Congress are grateful for their, their work and assistance in helping us govern our nation. More importantly, our federal employees need to know that we will do everything possible to keep them safe while they are at the workplace and away from their families. Today's hearing will provide us with the opportunity to hear from the IRS and its employee representatives concerning both the immediate and long-term impact of the February 18th attack in Austin. Additionally, we will hear from the Department of Homeland Security about its ongoing activities in the federal building security area, as well as from the U.S. Postal Service's Inspection Service. It is my hope that the testimony and feedback we receive from today's witnesses will provide the subcommittee with precise guidance and direction. Again, I thank each of you for being with us this afternoon, and I look forward to your uh, participation. Now I yield five minutes to our ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding, holding this important hearing. I appreciate all those uh, witnesses that are come to testify today. Uh, needless to say, we uh, we want to make sure that every federal employee and the public who is engaging with the, the federal government at all times is as safe as possible. People be able, uh, should deserve and uh, expect to work in a safe environment. Uh, we need to uh, constantly evaluate the standards and procedures, so I think this, uh, this hearing is particularly appropriate at this time. I look forward to hearing uh, the discussion. And for those very few but important members, uh, or men and women, who have uh, been on the wrong end of this violence, our heart thoughts and prayers go out to those, to those people. Uh, we need to continue to strive to improve and make the, the workplace as safe as we can, but also accessible at the same time. So I look forward to this hearing. I thank again the chairman for holding it and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. I'd now like to yield uh, five minutes to Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, the congresswoman from the District of Columbia, who has also been uh, at the forefront of, of uh, 
the, because of the number of federal facilities in, in her district, has also been at the forefront of this issue a long, for, for a long, long time. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I am especially appreciative that you have called this hearing uh, so soon after the attacks in Austin and right here in the National Capital Region, uh, first at, in the, at the IRS in, in Austin and here in this region at the, the Pentagon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in post 9-11 America, there got to be a renewed appreciation for federal workers and the kind of hammering of civil servants stopped. They recognized uh, how important uh, was the work of those who are spread across our, our government. Uh, it is very disturbing to see the uptick in attacks on federal employees uh, once again. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in, uh, during the last uh, 10 years or so, the Federal Protective Service was literally drained of employees, and it got so bad that uh, we asked and the Appropriation Committee mandated that a certain floor of Federal Protective Service uh, guards and officers be retained. Uh, there was uh, the, the notion that you, all you needed were, were security guards. You didn't even need a Federal Protective uh, Service, even though that's the oldest of the police forces in the federal government. It was very uh, disconcerting. Mr. Chairman, I chair a subcommittee with, with jurisdiction over federal construction and leasing and have some jurisdiction over the Federal Protective Service in that regard. And I'm a member of the Homeland Security Committee. And if I may say so, Mr. Chairman, the so-called interagency security committee uh, is something of a joke. This is a committee that's supposed to sit and coordinate um, uh, security for federal building sites and employees. But to show you just how um, uh, ineffective is the protection of federal workers, take a building like the new transportation, not so old, maybe about five years old, the transportation, the new transportation department. That is not a high security building. Mr. Chairman, when my staff with, um, with their um, capital and uh, with, with their, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, with their congressional tags on, have gone to that committee, they can't get in there. Somebody in the agency has to stop her work and come down in order for them to enter the premise, even though these people have the credentials of the United States Capitol on them. Uh, that's what you have at one end in, in a building that we do not think Al-Qaeda is much looking for. At the other end, we have more sensible security in some other parts of the government. How could this be? The reason it is this way, Mr. Chairman, is that security gets decided on the premises. No matter what they tell you, it's some GS9 somewhere who sits with a committee and decides who will come to this, in, into this, uh, this agency or not, and the rest of it. And if, uh, if, if it goes up to the secretary and the secretary said, that's fine with me, well, then even staff from the Capitol can't get in. If it's someone who has a more even sense of security and what, what it means, maybe they will. But I can tell you this, Mr. Chairman, I have seen security in buildings that I think Al-Qaeda would be far more interested in entering that do, do, do not have the security of the Transportation Department. And uh, we have had hearings ourselves on it. I, I, I would like very much for, for my subcommittee, for the Homeland Security Committee, and you, Mr. Chairman, to get together so that we can, in a concerted way, make the federal government protect federal employees by having one standard that is minimal and then tailor it to other parts of the government which may require more or less. Again, I very much appreciate the respect you show for the safety of federal employees by holding such a prompt hearing here this afternoon. Thank you. And I certainly, we, we are looking for best practices to be, to be adopted. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, for five minutes. I thank you, uh, Chairman Lynch, and thanks so much for holding this very important hearing. For the last year, we've witnessed a rise in violent rhetoric by extremist groups in America. Therefore, we must consider not only those infrastructure improvements to protect federal employees from terrorism, but also the manner in which we may exorcise justification of violence from public discourse. Less than one month ago, Andrew J. Joseph Stack 
intentionally crashed his small plane into a federal building in Austin, Texas. That included offices of the Internal Revenue Service, filled with federal employees. This terrorist attack killed Vernon Hunter, a 27-year-old federal employee who previously served two tours overseas in the armed forces. Incredibly, some political figures offered a tacit defense of that terrorist attack. One such individual was recorded as saying, quote, I think if we'd abolished the IRS back when I first advocated it, he wouldn't have had a target for his airplane, unquote. Previously, he told the Conservative Political Action Conference that he empathized with the terrorist who flew his plane into the federal building in Austin. This defense of terrorism is remarkable because under this logic, the victims of terrorism bear the responsibility of the terrorist attack. This implicit figure's reprehensible defense of terrorism is consistent with a disturbing trend of violent anti-government extremism we've seen in our country all too often. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, the slaughter engineered by Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, men steeped in the conspiracy theories and white-hot fury of the American radical right, marked the opening shot in a new kind of domestic political extremism. A revolutionary ideology whose practitioners do not hesitate to carry out attacks directed at entirely innocent victims, people selected essentially at random to make a political point. Since 1995, there have been over 75 violent attacks by domestic terrorists like Timothy McVeigh and Andrew Joseph Stack, including the 1996 bombing at the Atlanta Olympics by anti-abortion fanatic Eric Rudolph and the 2009 murder of a guard at the Holocaust Museum by anti-Semite James von Braun. It would be reprehensible enough for anyone to endorse violence generally, but even worse is endorsement of violence in response to nonviolent policies with which one might disagree, such as the terrorist attack against the IRS to express tax grievances. Terrorism can never be condoned. Violence against federal workers and installations is never acceptable. Those who for cheap political pandering, find themselves justifying it most assuredly, have the blood of its innocent victims, like Vernon Hunter, on their hands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The committee will now hear testimony from today's witnesses. It is the uh, standard policy of this committee that all witnesses who are to offer testimony shall be sworn. Uh, could I ask you to all stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you'll give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate that all the witnesses have each answered in the affirmative. What I'll do is uh, I'll offer a brief introduction of each of our witnesses, and then we will afford each an opportunity to testify for five minutes. First of all, Mr. Mark Goldstein is the Director of Physical Infrastructure Issues at the United States Government Accountability Office. Mr. Goldstein is responsible for the Government Accountability Office work in the areas of government property and telecommunications and has held other public sector positions, serving as Deputy Director and Chief of Staff to the District of Columbia Financial Control Board and as a senior staff member of the United States Senate Committee on Government Affairs. Mr. Goldstein is also an elected fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Mr. Stephen Miller is Deputy Commissioner for Services and Enforcement, providing direction and oversight for all major decisions affecting the four taxpayer-focused Internal Revenue Service divisions, wage and investment, large and mid-sized business, all business self-employed, and tax-exempt and government entities. He is also responsible for the IRS Criminal Investigation Division, which investigates income tax evasion the IRS Office of Professional Responsibility, which administers the laws governing the practice of tax professionals before the IRS, and the IRS Whistleblower Office, which receives information on tax cheating. Ms. Sue Armstrong was named the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary in September of 2009 of the Office of Infrastructure Protection, a division of the National Protection and Programs Directorate at the Department of Homeland Security. In this capacity, she supports the Assistant Secretary in leading the coordinated national effort to reduce the risk to the nation's critical infrastructure and key resources posed by acts of terrorism in increasing the nation's preparedness and rapid recovery in the event of an attack, natural disaster, or other emergency. 
Mr. Gary W. Schenkel is, was appointed Director of the Federal Protective Service, a Division of the National Protection and Programs Directorate at the Department of Homeland Security in March of 2007. A retired Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Schenkel has significant leadership and experience in a wide range of arenas, including organizational transformation efforts, security planning for public facilities, logistical planning and execution, and business administration. Mr. Guy T Cottrell joined the Postal Service in 1987 as a letter carrier in New Orleans, Louisiana in 2008. Mr. Cottrell was asked to come to national headquarters to lend his expertise and leadership to the chief postal inspector's role as chief security officer of the Postal Service as inspector in charge of the security and crime prevention communications group. In 2009, Mr. Cottrell was selected as Deputy Chief Inspector Headquarters Operations with oversight of all Postal Service National Security Programs. Welcome to all of our witnesses. Mr. Goldstein, you're now recognized for five minutes. Let me Mr. Just, Chairman I'm, and I'm sorry, Mr. Goldstein, let me just explain. Uh, that box in the middle of the table uh, will, will show green uh, while your uh, time is proceeding. It'll It'll show yellow uh, when it's time to wrap up, and then uh, red when you should uh, probably stop offering testimony. But uh, Mr. Goldstein. I'll take that warning. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss GAO's recent work on the Federal Protective Service and its efforts to protect federal facilities. Recent events, including last month's attack on Internal Revenue Service offices in Texas, and the January 2010 shooting in the lobby of a Nevada federal courthouse demonstrate the continued vulnerability of federal facilities and the safety of federal employees who occupy them. These events also highlight the continued challenges involved in protecting federal real property and reiterate the importance of the Federal Protective Service's efforts to protect the over one million government employees and members of the public who work in and visit the nearly 9,000 federal facilities. This testimony is based on past GAO reports and testimonies and discusses challenges FPS faces in protecting federal facilities and tenants agencies' perspectives of FPS's services. To perform this work, GAO visited a number of federal facilities, surveyed tenant agencies, analyzed documents, and interviewed officials from federal agencies and contract guard companies. Over the past five years, we have reported that FPS faces a number of operational challenges protecting federal facilities, including the following. First, FPS's ability to manage risk across federal facilities and implement security countermeasures is limited. FPS assess, assesses risk and recommends countermeasures to the General Services Administration and their tenant agencies. However, decisions to implement these countermeasures are frequently made by GSA and tenant agencies who have at times been unwilling to fund the countermeasures. Additionally, FPS takes a building by building approach to risk management rather than taking a more comprehensive strategic approach and assessing risks among all buildings in GSA's inventory and recommending countermeasure priorities to GSA and tenant agencies. Second, FPS has experienced difficulty ensuring that it has a sufficient staff and its inspector-based workforce approach raises questions about protection of federal facilities. While FPS is currently operating at its congressionally mandated staffing level of no fewer than 1,200 full-time employees, the agency has experienced difficulty determining its optimal staffing level to protect federal facilities. Additionally, until recently, FPS's staff was steadily declining, and as a result, critical law enforcement services have been reduced or eliminated. Third, FPS does not fully ensure that its contract security guards have the training and certifications required to be deployed to a federal facility. We found that FPS guards had not received adequate training to conduct their responsibilities. Specifically, some guards were not provided building-specific training, such as what actions to take during a building emergency or evacuation. This lack of training may have contributed to several incidents where guards neglected assigned responsibilities. Fourth, GSA has not been satisfied with FPS's performance, and some tenant agencies are unclear on FPS's role in protecting federal facilities. According to GSA, FPS has not been responsive and timely in providing security assessments for new leases. About one-third of FPS's customers could not comment on FPS's level of communication on various topics, including security assessments, a response that suggests that the division of roles and responsibilities between FPS and its customer is unclear. Some 82 percent did not use FPS for primary law enforcement response. FPS is taking steps to better protect federal facilities. For example, FPS is developing a new risk assessment program, 
and has recently focused on improving oversight of its contract guard program. While GAO is not making any new recommendations in this testimony, we note that FPS has not completed many co related corrective actions to our previous reports. We look forward to continued progress from DHS in the near future. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I'd be happy to answer questions you and the subcommittee may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldstein. Mr. Miller, you are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lynch, uh, <clears throat> Ranking Member Chaffetz, uh, and uh, Congresswoman Norton. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify on IRS workplace safety and security, uh, particularly, particularly in the wake of the, uh, the senseless attack last month on the IRS building in, in Austin, Texas, uh, that took the life of, of Vernon Hunter. Um, we are dedicated to ensuring safety and the well-being of our 100,000 employees, uh, no matter what their job is uh, nor where they are located. Um, the IRS workforce is our most valuable resource, and no violent act is going to deter us uh, from doing our jobs with dignity and respect for uh, the American public. At the IRS, security is managed by our Office of Physical Security and Emergency Preparedness, uh, which manages at a national level, ensuring we have consistent implementation of security policies and procedures. Uh, for 2010, we will spend just over $100 million on security at IRS offices. There are over 700 such facilities. As required under an executive order, we utilize the Interagency Security uh, Committee standards, the ISC standards, to determine what security to provide at a given facility. Depending upon the applicable security level under the standards, we will provide a variety of security tools, including highly visible guards and canines, uh, explosive and intrusion detection systems. We also employ access control systems, such as turnstiles, card key access, proximity cards, and lock and key control systems. Physical barriers include bollards, uh, crash fencing, uh, barriers, planters, and pop-up barriers. Screening measures focus on magnetometers, handheld wands, and x-ray machines. We also have a detailed incident reporting system uh, that's uh, available and up and running 24-7, uh, 365 days of the year that reports and tracks on these incidents. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the IRS employs a combination of strategies to plan, implement, and evaluate our security processes, uh, and we promote security and awareness for all IRS employees. Our employees, in fact, are our partners uh, in ensuring uh, security, workplace safety and security. In this regard, we conduct periodic evacuation drills and shelter-in-place exercise, uh, exercises which heighten employee emergency readiness. Um, if you watched any of the coverage in Austin, you saw that among the things that went right down there, and some things did in fact go right, Mr. Chairman, um, our drills proved their worth. People did get out of the building on a timely basis, and we lost only one life. Uh, we also issue recurring communications regarding security and safety uh, to reinforce processes and to raise awareness, including annual security awareness fairs that are held across the country. And we maintain an IRS intranet website that provides updated information on IRS physical security and emergency preparedness programs. Uh, from what I know today, Mr. Chairman, it's unlikely that there is anything we could have done to prevent the attack in Austin. Um, nonetheless, following that attack, we took a series of immediate steps to enhance our security posture, both in Austin and across the country, while we assess our long-term security needs and whether they have changed over time. The, this increased vigilance includes 24-7 guard service in all 11 IRS Austin offices. There's also additional security at IRS facilities across the country, including additional guard service at this time. In conclusion, this area remains a top concern for the IRS. Uh, and we will be taking a hard look at what we can do uh, in both the short and long term to ensure the safety of our folks. Nothing is more important to Treasury Sector Secretary Geithner, Commissioner Shulman, uh, Shulman nor myself. Um, um, thanks, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Ms. Armstrong, you're now welcome to offer uh, testimony for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chaffetz, and um, Congresswoman. It's a pleasure to, to appear before you today to discuss. Ms. Armstrong, Am could I you not? pull that mic a little closer to you? It's a pleasure to appear before you today to discuss the work of the Interagency Security Committee. Um, the Interagency Security Committee was created as a direct result of the Oklahoma City bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in 1995, the worst domestic-based terrorist attack in U.S. history. The mission of the Interagency Security Committee is to develop standards, policies, and best practices for enhancing the quality and effectiveness of physical security in and the protection of 
the over 300,000 non-military federal facilities in the United States. <coughs> the Department of Homeland Security's Assistant Secretary for Infrastructure Protection chairs the Interagency Security Committee, which is composed of senior executives from 45 member departments and agencies that contribute to the publication of innovative products to increase the security of federal facilities, to protect federal employees and the visiting public. For example, in March 2008, the Interagency Security Committee developed and published the federal, excuse me, facility security level determinations for federal facilities, which defines criteria and processes facilities should use to determine their facility security level. In June 2009, per recommendation from the Government Accountability Office, the Interagency Security Committee developed the use of physical security performance measures the first federal policy guidance on performance measures for physical security programs and testing procedures. In addition, the Interagency Security Committee is currently in the final stages of a comprehensive multi-year effort to integrate 15 years of standards, lessons learned, and countermeasures for threats to federally owned and leased facilities. These documents will comprise the most comprehensive standards for federal facilities created to date. The Assistant Secretary for Infrastructure Protection also oversees the work of the Office of Infrastructure Protection, which conducts vulnerability assessments on the government facilities sector. These assessments identify security gaps and provide the foundation for risk-based implementation of protective programs. The Office of Infrastructure Protection also distributes the Infrastructure Protection Report Series, which provides protection information tailored to address issues faced by federal buildings, such as large government office buildings and federal courthouses. And my colleague from the Federal Protective Service will describe the department's role in protecting these facilities in greater detail. I appreciate the opportunity to address the committee on this important issue, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schenkel, you're welcome to offer testimony for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Chaffetz, Congresswoman Norton. It is a pleasure to appear before you today to discuss the actions of the Federal Protective Service as, as the Federal Protective Service undertakes to ensure the safety and security of federal government buildings. The Federal Protective Service performs fixed post access control, screening functions, roving patrols at 9,000 General Service Administration owned and leased facilities. In fiscal year 2009, the Federal Protective Service responded to 35,812 calls for service including 1,242 protests and organized disturbances, made 1,646 arrests, conducted 1,115 criminal investigations, processed 272 weapons violations, and prevented the introduction of 661,724 prohibited, prohibited items into federal facilities, all of which, all with the significant assistance of our contract guards known as protective security officers. FPS was transferred at the start of the fiscal year to the National Protection and Programs Directed, a component within DHS whose core mission is national resiliency that ranges from physical infrastructure protection to cybersecurity. While we are focused on ensuring a smooth transition of the organi organization, we believe this new structure will better position us within the department to receive the necessary support and meet our critical responsibilities moving forward. Primary among the Federal Protective Service's core mission requirements is the facility security assessment. The facility security assessment identifies existing and potential threats to federal facilities and their occupants. The Federal Protective Service takes an all hazards approach to facility security assessment and evaluates the risks against possible mitigation measures built into our new risk assessment and management program. Those mitigating countermeasures are then presented to each facility security committee with recommendations on which countermeasures should be implemented, including the development of an occupant emergency plan. The Federal Protective Service systematically measures the effectiveness of our countermeasures through a variety of systematic programs, such as annual countermeasure effectiveness inventories, scheduled guard posts and guard vendor inspections, and one of our most visible means, Operation Shield. Operation Shield conducts unannounced inspections to measure the effectiveness of contract guards in detecting the presence of unauthorized persons, potentially disruptive or dangerous activities in, around, in or around <coughs> federal facilities, and the guards' ability to prevent the introduction of prohibitive items or harmful substances into those facilities. Operation Shield also serves as a visible, proactive, and random measure that may be used as a deterrent to disrupt the planning of terrorist activities. 
In addition, the Federal Protective Service routinely provides security awareness training for employees, which includes presentations on how to avoid becoming a victim of theft or violence. And we've also developed active shooter training, explaining what employees should do when faced with a violent situation and how to respond when law enforcement arrives. FPS has taken several actions and initiatives to address major areas identified by the Government Accountability Office, including human capital management, finance, guard contract oversight. FPS continues to develop additional information collection and analysis tools. FPS addressed the current GAO report regarding contract guard oversight and lapses in screening procedures by determining the cause of the lapses and recommending measures to prevent reoccurrence, increasing the frequency of guard posts and performance of protective security officers referred to as con formerly referred to as contract security officers, requiring additional training in magnetometer and x-ray including contract modification requiring the viewing of an FPS-produced training video that addresses screening for improvised explosive devices, ensuring that all protective security officers are compliant with certifications and qualifications as stated in contract by incorporating the certification system into our risk assessment management program, or RAMP, developing and initiating a 16-hour magnetometer X-ray training program provided by or excuse me, provided to protective security officers by Federal Protective Service inspectors titled the National Weapons Detection Program, which has begun in January 2010. As a result of the Covert Testing Working Group, FPS developed Covert Testing Program, which enhanced and complemented the ongoing efforts to improve oversight and improve the attentiveness and professionalism of the protective security officer. This current program further achieves FPS strategic goals of effectively and efficiently securing federal facilities and keeping their occupants safe. These are just some of the many ways the Federal Protective Service contributes to the safety, of, uh, safety and security of federal buildings and their occupants. I look forward to the opportunity to answer any questions you may have, and I thank you and the committee for holding this, imp this important hearing. Thank you, Mr. Schenkel. Uh, Mr. Cottrell, welcome. You are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Good afternoon, Chairman Lynch, Congressman Chaffetz, and Congresswoman Norton. My name is Guy Cottrell, Deputy Chief Inspector for the United States Postal Inspection Service. I am pleased to be with, here with you today to discuss safety and security practices at the Postal Service. While I am a Postal Inspector, please note that in today's testimony I am providing information that reflects security strategies across many different functions within the Postal Service. I will begin with the Inspection Service. Our mission is to protect the Postal Service and its employees, secure the nation's mail system, and ensure public trust in the mail. Postal inspectors are federal law enforcement officers who carry firearms, make arrests, and serve federal search warrants and subpoenas. There are approximately 1,400 postal inspectors nationwide and abroad who enforce more than 200 federal laws involving the use of the U.S. mail and the postal system. The Inspection Service maintains a security force staffed by roughly 650 uniformed postal police officers who are assigned to critical postal facilities across the country. The officers provide perimeter security, escort high-value mail shipments, and perform essential protective functions. The Postal Service has a number of ways we provide security for our employees and buildings. The Postal Service has a cross-functional program to comprehensively review a building's security. The program helps postmasters and installation heads achieve and maintain compliance with policies governing all aspects of security. The review includes comprehensive on-site observations, document reviews, and interviews of facility personnel. At the conclusion of each assessment, a plan is developed to address any issues identified in that review. Emphasizing the key role that each employee plays in each other's safety is one of our prime strategies. Special emphasis has been placed on developing employee communication safety materials. For example, each week at facilities nationwide, managers are required to give safety stand-up talks. Simple tips to employees, such as reporting the condition of fences or public access to the workroom floor, all contribute to employee safety. We will shortly begin an educational campaign aimed specifically at our letter carriers. <coughs> A major component of the Postal Service's Workplace Violence Prevention Program is the District Threat Assessment Team. Threat assessment teams use cross-functional team approaches to assess threatening situations and to develop risk abatement plans to minimize the potential risk of future violence. 
The Postal Service has established an agency-wide continuity program. The continuity program deals with issues that arise prior to, during, and after an event relative to the employee's safety and welfare. This program is tested and exercised on an annual basis. Our plan calls for the notification of all employees of a facility that an event has occurred and where each employee is to report. We have a toll-free number for all Postal Service employees to use in the event of an emergency to receive information about facility closings and operating status. We are updating a computer program which will identify critical postal facilities in the path of approaching storms, provide floodplain modeling and real-time storm updates, as well as estimate anticipated impacts on postal assets. The inspection service routinely works with other local and federal law enforcement agencies. We also participate in training exercises. This ensures that postal employees' equipment and procedures are ready to manage an emergency without interrupting operations. The Inspection Service conducts and evaluates training on procedures for emergency management personnel and other essential staff. This promotes preparedness, improves response capabilities, assures that all systems are appropriate, and determines the effectiveness of our command, control, and communications processes. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about some of the Postal Service's initiatives on safety and security. I would be pleased to answer any questions the subcommittee may have. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. I'll now yield myself five minutes. Director Goldstein, uh, given, I, I had an opportunity to read your report from, I think it was June of 09, June of 09 where you did an assessment of uh, the Federal Protection Service, uh, and uh, it, it, was, it was very, very helpful. I was wondering, I'm not sure if it was a fair point in time to take a snapshot, however. I know that uh, up until 2007, uh, the Federal Protection Service was in the process of uh, scaling down, downsizing. And then Congress in 2008 said, stop downsizing, start hiring. Uh, we came in with a minimum staffing requirement of, I think, 1,400. And uh, so then FBS had to reverse what they were doing and start hiring, uh, which were, they were not prepared to do. And that's when you took the snapshot. So there was a, there's some difficulty here transitioning from one function to the other, or one, one policy to the other. I'm, I'm just wondering if you've had a, a more recent opportunity to do that analysis. I know you, you had folks, or, or perhaps you yourself went to various uh, facilities and, and did this assessment. You talked to customers. You talked to a lot of people. I thought, I thought the report was fairly comprehensive uh, in terms of the number of districts that you had re uh, reached out to. But uh, is, there a, is there a more recent assessment that you've made uh, in terms of the readiness of uh, the Federal Protective Service and its ability to meet Congress's uh, more recent uh, mandate? Mr. Chairman, we've done a number of reports, as you know, over the years. In um, 2008, we issued a report, which was sort of our more recent baseline report, which began to reveal a lot of the issues that were coming about as a result of the uh, downsizing that the agency was undergoing. As you mentioned, since then, a floor has been placed of 1,250 individuals, about 950 of whom must be law enforcement officers. We have done additional work since that time. We issued a report on human capital planning at the Federal Protective Service. We did uh, testimony preliminary findings, uh, at which you're referring to from last summer, in which we did uh, a variety of things, including some penetration testing of federal buildings, as well as looking at the contract guard program. We will shortly issue a final report uh, looking at those issues to a number of committees on, of Congress that requested that work. So we are continuing to do work on the agency and there are some additional reports that Congress has requested that we uh, also do, including taking a look at the transition into NPPD as well as taking a look at RAMP and whether RAMP will be a successful program in helping the agency. So we have continuing work uh, on the way. One of the, one of the problems that I have in making a assessment of all federal facilities and 30 of those facilities the legislative branch and we have the Capitol Police and we've got our own sort of uh, sorry uh, one of the problems that I have <laughs> thank you sir thank you uh, one of the problems I have in assessing system-wide uh, federal security is that 
For example, here on Capitol Hill, the legislative branch, we have the Capitol Police. We sort of have our own security system that we, we operate, uh, as does the federal court system. They sort of have the, they have the marshals inside the building. They've got FPS outside. We have the Capitol Police. It's really a, uh, it's sort of organic. Each, each agency, DOD does their own thing. And so it's, it's tough to take uh, one measurement. Uh, is, there, is there a study or, or uh, review that you're taking, undertaking now that would help me with that? Or are you just responding uh, as requested from these different committees? Most of our time up until now, we've focused on the Federal Protective Service because of the GSA properties. But we have received recent requests from the House Homeland Security Committee to examine just what you're suggesting, which is more broadly taking a look at how security of federal property across the entire spectrum is managed, who's responsible for it, how it interacts, how they coordinate, what kind of challenges they face. So we will be getting that work soon, sir. All right. I guess what I'm asking, are there gaps in what we're requesting in order to get a good sense of what, what is going on and what the entire uh, picture is here in the federal government? We've recently received a number of requests from House Homeland Security, which I think fills a lot of those gaps, but I will be happy to take a look at what we do have oh. in that we're supposed to begin to work on and, and talk with your staff about some of those gaps. Yes, sir. That would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldstein. Uh, Chair, and I recognize this, Mr. Chaffetz, our ranking member, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Goldstein, if, if we could start. The, use the word confusion when you're talking about the uh, uh, interaction with local law enforcement res responding to situations in federal buildings. Can, can we expand on that just a little bit more? Because there are multiple jurisdictions that are off would, would respond to some sort of incident. But explain to us a little bit more what you meant by confusion that, that is out there. Yes, sir. I'd be happy to. Um, several years ago, in 2008, when we began discussions with the Federal Protective Service on their relationships with local police, at that time, they explained to us that as they were decreasing the size of FPS, they would be relying more on local law enforcement and entering into memorandums of understanding with local law enforcement around the country to assist them in times of emergency. Over time, they realized that those MOUs probably would not be sustainable because many local law enforcement entities have enough of their own problems going on and, and would not wish to enter into such agreements, and that ultimately is what they found. What they told us at the time and is that they were continuing, however, to develop relationships with local law enforcement and that they had sort of more informal and ad hoc relationships to help them in times of emergency. And that, I suspect, is true. We often see local law enforcement responding to, to the scene when situations occur. However, what has concerned us is we've done interviews in the course of our audit work in which we have s spoken to precinct commanders, for instance, in a major metropolitan area, literally within sight of level four federal buildings, major level four buildings, who had no idea w of when the last time they saw an FPS officer was, what kind of relationship existed with that building a block or two blocks away, and what their responsibility would be in, in you know, an occurrence. Let's do that. I, I, uh, my, my guess is my sense, based on what the, the chairman was also asking, this is something we'd like to explore further and, and, and learn a, a lot more about. Uh, yes, sir. So We'd if, be happy if we to, could, that would be great. to explore that with the staff. Yes, sir. Um, and can you help me, particularly Mr. Schenkel, uh, understand, at least over the last 24 to 36 months, uh, two to three years, what is the trend in the number of people that are working and helping to secure? If you can push that and bring it a little I'm real sorry. close. They have to be real close to the mouth, yeah. Okay. Um, it's been very positive. Uh, when we get the relief as a result of the 2008 omnibus bill, we were able to hire an additional 150 uh, FPS inspectors. Uh, in addition to that, we were able to revamp the training curriculum at the physical security training program, uh, our in-house academy down at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Uh, we have... It, and again, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. I only got just a five minutes and I want to touch on two other okay. subjects. So if you could provide us and the committee some additional details as to where that staffing is going for, for both the physical infrastructure and, and some of the other issues, that, that would be great. 
And then if you could also, you mentioned uh, 600,000, the confiscation of 600,000 plus prohibited, I prohibited items. Yes, sir. Um, I would love to see what, what's on that list. And if there's a detail as to how many of, you know, knives or how many this or that. Uh, I, I'm, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm concerned about this not only in these facilities but also at airports as well. I think we need to look at um, you know, what are we going to do about it? Is there enough of a, a deterrent, if you will, to trying to get or bring these items in? I'm sure a lot of them happen accidentally, uh, but we're not talking about oversized shampoos here is my guess. My guess is we're talking about something that's uh, a little bit more nefarious in its nature. Uh, I recognize that the demand on the security personnel to have to be right all of the time, uh, but I worry that these numbers are so huge, and I've heard similar things at the TSA uh, as well. So I'd like to explore that and get additional um, uh, information about that uh, as we move forward, because that's just not acceptable to have so many prohibited items trying to be pushed and moved through the system. Obviously, there's there's room for error along the way. So. Um, my time is concluding here, so I'll yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Schenkel, you are perhaps, I'm sure, I should not even say perhaps, aware, aware of Mr. Goldstein's uh, testimony some months back where um, the GAO used uh, test testers who were able to smuggle bomb parts into, I think it was perhaps as many as 10 uh, federal facilities, take them into a men's room, and uh, if necessary, uh, assemble them. Can you tell this subcommittee today that that has been corrected since it's at least a year old, I think, that that testimony was offered? Yes, ma'am. We've taken uh, dramatic steps as a result of that. Mr. Mr. Schenkel, could you pull that microphone a little closer to you and just make sure to turn it on? This is odd. Usually they're telling me to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Not here. Yes, sir. Um, we've taken a number of steps as a result of the uh, penetration test that the GAO conducted to include a, we initiated a gap analysis to identify where those problems came from. We uh, revamped the uh, X-ray magnetometer training. We have initiated the National Weapons Detection Program, which is an additional 16 hours of magnetometer and X-ray training for all of our protective security officers. Uh, we have also instituted the, the uh, uh, covert testing working group, which I mentioned in my initial testimony, uh, where our, our individual criminal investigators uh, with a standardized uniform policy and a standardized uniform uh, testing kit have... Well, uh, Mr. Schenkel, we have a, a call into my office from someone who called himself a Federal Protective Services employee who uh, uh, said to us that the FPS plans to eliminate its hazmat program and of course these are the programs that monitor dangerous packages uh, and provide training for such monitoring. Is the FPS planning to eliminate its hazmat program? No ma'am it is not. Um, is, it, is it still the case that uh, we have a proliferation of guards who uh, remain stationary and cannot leave their posts even to assist a Federal Protective Service uh, officer? It, it depends on the building and the responsibilities Who of that post. Who decides that, Mr. Schenkel? It's a combination of the f Facility Security Committee that writes the post orders and the relationship. And the Facility Security Committee within each building? Yes, ma'am. That's my problem, Mr. Schenkel. <laughs> you know, if you are a very highly qualified uh, employee at HHS, you don't know a hill of beans about security. The, the, the delegation of so much of security to internal committees almost guarantees that what Mr. Goldstein found will happen. Um, uh, Mr. Schenkel, uh, we know and there has been testimony that these guards not only can't leave their posts, uh, they believe if they do leave their posts, even to engage in a chase on their own or assisting an FPS uh, officer, they may face liability. Is that the case? Have they been told that if you leave your post, somebody's coming in uh, with a gun, he runs? Should the guard, not the FPS officer, you have a proliferation of guards, not FPS officers, should that guard, should that guard run after that 
uh, person who's trying to run away with a gun or with whatever he has in his hand? That's an identified training gap that we take on the responsibility for. We have to ensure that those guards are aware that they are not on their own personal liability when Mr. those Chairman, kinds of instances so, happen. What is so um, um, scary about testimony after testimony is, 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 is this has been the case ever since guards have been used. Is that not the case, Mr. Goldstein? I mean, this, is, this could have been corrected many years ago, but this policy of not leaving your post has been the policy all along, has it not, Mr. Goldstein? That's my understanding, ma'am. Uh, how is it that with the Congress having said you should have no fewer than 1,200 officers, uh, Mr. Goldstein reports that the FPS officers are on something called reduced hours? Why would they be on reduced hours? I'm not aware of that, ma'am. If anything, uh, Mr. they're Goldstein, on extended you, you, you hours. You say in your testimony, you, you report reduced hours. That's where I got it from. Yes, ma'am. What we're referring to is during the period of time, certainly, that the Federal Protective Service was reducing its personnel, its officers, the law enforcement security officers and the remaining patrol officers, the FPS made a decision that in most places there would not be weekend hours, there would not be Hours Mr. Schenkel, uh, if there are federal employees in a building during weekend hours, uh, is there a federal protective service service there during those hours? It depends on the uh, the location, ma'am. And again, who decides that, Mr. Schenkel? Um, it, it's a combination of the depend or the needs of the facilities, if they are isolated facilities, and or of the region, if they are in a regional facility. There is 24/7 coverage. Mr. Schenkel, isn't it true that the, the internal committee is who basically is making these decisions, not your officers? In in some cases, but not in all cases. It, it I think this is a very serious uh, proposition, Mr. Chairman, uh, that security is in the hands of civilians who happen to be sitting on these committees. Uh, and who, given the power, is going to use it as they see fit. Is that not the case, Mr. Goldstein? We have found a number of weaknesses with the, the building security committees, now called facility security committees. We, they, are represented, they are made up of representatives from the tenant agencies, usually the largest tenant agency in the individual building uh, serves as the chair. I have attended a number of these meetings over the years just to see how they operate. And while I think they are well-intentioned, and they certainly sh should have an advisory role, we have been concerned that you have a very balkanized, fragmented approach to the security of GSA's portfolio when every building gets to make significant decisions about security, how security is managed as opposed to FPS being allowed to do a portfolio-wide approach that's based on risk management uh, principles. Yeah, as, 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 uh, as competent and dedicated as um, for that matter, a member of Congress may be, who is my colleague. I don't want that member of Congress deciding security for, for entry into this building. And, Mr. Chairman, may I just say, finally, in closing, that uh, the time has come, I think, for the committees who have been concerned about this uh, to mandate that security be in the hands of trained security officials. And I would like very much to work with you, your ranking member. Uh, and to ask uh, the members of the Homeland Security Committee and the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, which also has some jurisdiction over FPS employees, to all get together. Maybe if we gang up on this problem, uh, we can get better security for federal employees. Funded through a uh, security fee of, of charges per square foot. At this point, it's up to 66 cents a square foot. And what happens is these agencies see all this money uh, flowing to FPS, they get decreased services year by year. So how do they pay for the outsourced police forces that they set up without any expertise of their own? Uh, I don't know. See, I, here, I, you, I, have, it, here you have FPS saying you've got to have it per square foot. And they say, okay, since nobody is, is compelling me to use them, who cares about those standards? Let's just hire our own independent police force and make our own standards. And how anybody can tell me that's going to protect the IRS or any other agency, I don't know. But I'm, I think it's important to note that we're not here talking about what FBS does or shouldn't do. We're talking about the existence of an aux auxiliary police forces or 
I should say, alternative police forces in agencies where at will they can decide who they are, what their standards are, with, that, with virtually no federal oversight through the FPS or for that matter through the Department of Homeland Security. Um, what's the relationship, Mr. Mr. Adler or Mr. Wright, uh, of the FPS to the local police forces of a particular city or county? It varies. You know, I think Director Shankle hit on it. But in my experience, what I've seen, you know, th th there can be a commonality, there can be a camaraderie, but ultimately, most of local law enforcement, first of all, they're not allowed to carry within a federal facility. Most of them aren't familiar with the layout. So if you rang the alarm and they came, they might find the front door, but they may not be familiar with the layout. I think the role of local law enforcement, to put it in proper perspective, is really to arrive on the scene quickly to provide perimeter security, crowd control, but really it's incumbent upon the police officers, the law enforcement components within the building, working for the agencies to respond and prevent the situation from going from bad to worse. Um, and I think that's important, that's important to the record, Mr. Mr. Chairman, since Mr. Schenkel said they, they depend on local police forces and uh, I, I, the notion that busy police forces should do anything but what they would do anyway if there was something on the outside of the business is, is very disconcerting to hear. M Mr. Chairman, if I could just conclude by noting that in Mr. Wright's testimony and ask him if he knows what these cities are, he says at a, min at a minimum, Around, I'm looking at page, it, doesn't know, it isn't numbered, at a, it's under FPS structural problems. At a minimum, around the clock protection by federal law enforcement officers should be provided in the 18 to 22 cities with the greatest concentration of employees, meaning federal employees, and facilities. Uh, and I think you say that 24 hour service is only provided in two cities. What are those cities? Um, can I can I approach that off the record? I'm not sure. I should say. In a if you setting. yes, could you could could yes. you make sure that the chairman understands yes. I, that? I think you'll be very surprised. Um, yeah, uh, that the chairman gets that that in camera, so we can understand that. I, I just think that what what we know what the those almost anybody could guess what those 18 uh, cities, uh, 18 of 22 cities with the greatest concentration are, and everybody would know that those are the cities that we regard as most targeted. And what your testimony here today has informed us is that we got to get on the stick. What happened to our IRS with, with, the, with extraordinary sadness from all of us um, uh, was a kamikaze event of the kind that perhaps no, no, no police force of any kind uh, could have deterred, but it certainly ought to be a, a, a shot across our so-called bow to remember that this is not, not the kind of attacks we should be expecting, especially in IRS offices. I have found, I work very closely with the IRS here, I have found IRS employees to be among the most collegial, the most customer-oriented employees in the United States government. But if you're out here in this recession, paying taxes, lost your job, uh, house gone, and you can't find anybody else to be mad at, there's always your local IRS employee, and we have a duty to protect these employees uh, every day of the week that they are on duty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Kelly, and, and welcome. I'm sorry. I'm was stuck up here the other day, and, uh, and I, I thank you for your kind introduction in my absence. In, in your prepared statement, you made reference to the fact that you were shocked at some statements by certain public officials after the tragedy in Austin. Would you elaborate? Uh, there was a member of the House of Representatives who, um, I don't have the quotes in front of me, so I would not want to misquote. Um, I'm sure most have seen them in the press, and I'd be glad to provide them. Um, but, uh, and when I issued statements, um, and also to a member of the Senate, and when I issued statements um, expressing shock and um, disappointment and looking for an apology, uh, they were not forthcoming. Those apologies have never been forthcoming. And I think that um, it's outrageous that anyone would make statements uh, like those that have been made, much less someone in, you know, anyone in a public position that should be supporting federal employees who are just trying to do their jobs. If you want to provide more for the record, I, I will be glad to it do that. It would be welcome. Thank you. Um, 
Mr. Adler, uh, could you elaborate a little bit? I, I had, you spoke fast, uh, and although I'm originally from Boston, I have lived in the South so long now, uh, I have <laughs> trouble sometimes following a fast presentation. But you were making a point about the difference between, if I understood your testimony, GSA's first screen versus, say, the Israeli approach to security. Could you just elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, we, we've been addressing this in the TSA venue as well. The, the concept of taking proactive steps in the law enforcement security arena to not simply sit back and become reactionary, become a, you know, a, a duck in a barrel, if you will, and pray that the barrel is, is durable enough to withstand the attack. Be proactive, but of course, it's very convenient for me to come here and say we should be proactive. You need resources to accomplish that. You need human beings in uniforms with training and capability and authority to do it. And, you know, and, and, and out of respect to, to Director Shankle, he's making do with what he has, whether it's, it's setting memo use with local law enforcement or anyone else. Ideally, we would have enough. You know, we're talking about whether we have police officers or inspectors. I like all of the above. I'd love to have police officers at every law enforcement or federal government facility. But that would enable us to take a more proactive approach, to have the, the proper equipment like cameras and so forth, so we can monitor the area, have the plainclothes contingent out there who know, who are, are trained in behavior, behavioral, you know, actions and, 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 and just things, little indicators we can pick up. I mean, I know firsthand FPS d does an excellent job of that at 26 Federal Plaza in New York. You know, that's the sort of thing that we do want to have happen. But once again, the starting point is having the resources to engage in that type of proactive uh, investigative security law enforcement activities. Although, as Mr. Miller of the other panel indicated, all of that, if we did everything you just said, it still would not have prevented the terrorist attack in Austin. Correct. There's two aspects we're talking about here for this hearing. One is prevention, the other is response. We have to concede, Colleen mentioned the plane coming into the building. We concede that. Then we're defined how we respond. So taking it from initially, you know, the Israeli approach will minimize the, the prevention side of things. But, and as we all know, human error will occur, something will get in, whether it's an active shooter or an explosive device. The question then is, what are we trained and capable of doing in response? So that was the other side of what I was trying to present. All right. In your, thank you. In your testimony, you also said, if I heard you correctly, that the IRS puts both the public and its own employees at risk. What were you referring to? That, well, that was, I was referring to quotations that were sent to me. I received a lot of emails. I requested input. I have 65 agencies we represent. Each one has an agency representative. So when the email goes out, they serve the input. What that was reflecting was, I think it's a lot of frustration among my, my CID special agent members who are concerned that they want to passionately get involved. They listen to what Colleen describes, and they feel as if they have to make it up at game time. You can't wing it. You have to plan for it. And you have to you know, step up and recognize IRS is always going to be a threatened component by virtue of what they do. So you have to commit resources to training the special agents who are there, who are the first responders, to make sure they're not going to make it up when it happens, to make sure they don't have to rely upon somebody who takes the initiative and a heroic ability to help in a fire drill or put someone on their back. They should plan, and that will minimize or actually will increase their effectiveness in responding to one of these types of attacks. And in and, and what little time I have left, Mr. Wright, uh, you talked about the FPS being dysfunctional, citing some studies that would say that. Um, uh, if you have a series of recommendations, I'd welcome seeing them. One quick question. Do you have a view about the relative merits between, say, a, a federal guard, a federal employee, versus contract security? Uh, as stated earlier, uh, private guards have basically a mishmash of authority across the U.S. Um, every city, every state is different. Uh, the benefits to having a federal guard are more likely, uh, are, are more likely recommendation is federal police officers like you have here at the Capitol is they are fletzy trained and they have that federal authority to, to immediately stop and, and detain threats or, or take action against individuals uh, that enter the property. What we see now, and, and I'll be glad to share uh, later uh, on the record, um, a, a major city 
uh, where it's been documented. Now, I've always had the anecdotal evidence over the years that guards, private guards, are afraid to put their hands on anyone. Uh, we've got uh, documented cases of, of individuals running from FPS police officers and guards standing by. And just here in the last couple of days, I received some very disturbing information uh, where it's been absolutely documented in our Operation Shield uh, efforts across the country that these guards are witnessing threats or are witnessing um, our attempts uh, to, to penetrate. Um, we're witnessing these guards say, I can't do anything. I have to stop if I see something on that mag or that X-ray screen uh, that looks threatening. I'm not going to stop that individual. I'm going to call FPS, or uh, I'm going to, in some cases, I'm going to call the company first. So that's the problem. Federal officers would have that authority right here, right now. Stop that individual, take him down, and do what has to be done. You you have a lot of private officers out there that are afraid for their own liability. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. I want to thank the uh, members of the panel for your willingness to come before the Congress and uh, offer your suggestions and, and offer your testimony. I'm going to leave the record open for three days for those members who are in other committees and haven't had an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, but other than that, we, we appreciate your testimony here today, and uh, we bid you good day. This, this subcommittee is now adjourned.